Yeah, thank you. So it's with great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Anders Bertram, who is going to talk about the genomic history of wolves and dogs. Uh, a few words about uh, Anders. He did his uh, uh, PhD at the uh, Sanger Institute with uh, Chris Tyler Smith, working on uh, uh, Papuan and Australian populations, genetic uh, diversity and history. And then he moved on to the Francis uh, Creek Institute to uh, four and a half year uh, postdoc with uh, with Professor Pontus Skonglen. And during this time, a part of it, uh, one of the main elements of the only one, uh, at least two or three science papers on uh, genomic history of wolves and dogs. And uh, he's going to talk about it now. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for the introduction and the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. So I've, I've seen the, the list of, of other speakers you have in the seminar series, and so I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about, talk about my work that's primarily done during my, my postdoc with, with Pontus at the Crick, where we try to use ancient DNA to, to learn about the history of, of the wolf and the dog which, uh, as I will tell you about, is, is still kind of a, a major mystery. Where does the dog come from? Uh, but also other questions about its later evolution, connections to people, and also a little bit about the, the natural history of the wolf itself. So, the origin of the dog is really a, a special history in human prehistory because it is the first organism that we domesticated. So, if you look at this timeline of when different animals were domesticated, we can see that most of them were domesticated in the last kind of 10,000 years or, or so. So uh, uh, basically after the advent of agriculture. But the dog is very different in that it was domesticated much earlier, so at least 15,000, probably even earlier, perhaps 20, 25,000 years ago, which of course places it in a very different chapter of human prehistory back uh, during the, the Ice Age, the Pleistocene. And uh, somehow, somewhere, people went out and entered this, this uh, relationship with a wild carnivore, kickstarting this process of evolution that has given rise to all dogs that we know today. But we don't really know when this happened with much precision, where it happened in the world. Uh, did it happen once or multiple times? And what was the kind of human cultural context in which this process started? And so one of the problems here has been that there is no clear geographical signal in the archaeological record of dogs. So with other domestic animals, it's clear that the, the, the first domestic versions appear, for example, first in the Fertile Crescent, and then later do they spread elsewhere. But with dogs, they just kind of pop up a bit all over the place in the period kind of 10 to 15,000 years ago. Um, and so it, this doesn't necessarily point to any single place as the origin. And then in the last kind of perhaps 20 years or so, genetics has entered this debate, but rather than clearing things up, I think genetic studies have actually muddied the waters even further because different genetic studies have proposed very different places as the origin of dogs. Uh, and I think one of the issues here is that people have tried to look at patterns of genetic diversity within dogs to try to infer an origin, sometimes with an analogy being made to the human out of Africa model where you have higher diversity at the origin and lower diversity elsewhere. But I think it, this doesn't necessarily work so well in dogs. Uh, you can't necessarily apply that same uh, reasoning for various reasons. Uh, I, and I think what you really would like to do instead is to compare dog genomes to different wolves in different parts of the world and say that they are closer to some dogs. Uh, but this hasn't really worked either. There isn't really a wolf population today that is clearly closer to dogs than what other wolves are. And so we find ourselves in a situation where we still don't really know where dogs come from. And pretty much anywhere, I think, in, in Eurasia is pretty much possible. And so this, is, this was a big motivation for, for this project where we thought that, okay, uh, the archaeological record doesn't really solve this question. Studying genetic diversity within dogs doesn't really solve it. Uh, and comparing to present-day wolves doesn't really solve it either. Instead, we wanted to... Uh, look at ancient wolves, wolf genomes. The idea being that if we, if we can study wolf diversity, not today, but at the time or closer to the time that dogs were domesticated, then we should be able to, to place dogs within that picture. And so we can have circumvent all of this later evolution that has occurred in, in wolves, because of course, wolves have kept uh, moving around, mixing with each other. 
We know a lot of them have, have gene flow from domestic dogs, which complicates this whole picture. But if we can go back in time with ancient DNA and study uh, wolves closer to the time of dog domestication, then we should be able to hopefully say something about where, where dogs come from. So this was the motivation behind this project where we sequenced 72 ancient wolf genomes that span the last, uh, the last 100,000 years. Uh, and so they are primarily from Europe, Siberia, and North America. And they actually constitute a quite quite nice time series across this period, which means that we can we can also just use this data, data to study the natural history of the wolf species, uh, which of course is interesting in its own right. It's one of the large carnivores that survived the last glacial maximum or the the the, the, the ice age more generally, where many other large carnivores disappeared. And so perhaps there's something we can learn about uh, why the, the wolf survived this period. And then additionally, we can ask all of these questions about where, where dogs come from. So uh, I will first talk a little bit about wolf natural history. And in, in general, I think uh, a message I would like to get across is that if, if we want to understand where dogs come from, we, we really need to get serious about wolf history in itself. I think we, we can't really understand where dogs come from if we don't understand their wild progenitors. So here is a kind of big picture view of what we found by studying these ancient wolf genomes. So here is a, a PC, PCA analysis where I'm plotting only PC1 against the time on the horizontal axis or the, the age of each wolf genome. And so what you can see here is that there's a very clear correlation between PC1 and the time. So essentially PC1 in, in the wolf species is essentially time. So at any given point in time, all the wolves that lived then are genetically similar to each other, whether they lived in Europe, Siberia, or Alaska. There's a few outlier individuals. You can see these dark green points that are kind of shifted down from the trend line. And these are North American wolves that have coyote admixture. So we know that today, wolves and coyotes are mixing heavily in, in North America. And these results show that this is far from a recent phenomenon. So they have been mixing for at least 100,000 years. And those individuals that have coyote ancestry are then kind of shifted downwards. They look older than they are in some sense. But so those outliers aside, there's this very clear correlation between genetic ancestry and time. So it's almost like a kind of single population moving forward in time. Uh, and everyone stays, co stays connected genetically rather than diverging um, as you move forward in time. Then we also looked at the absolute level of genetic differentiation. So using the FST metric uh, between different populations of wolves uh, at different points in time. And we found that kind of back before 20,000 years ago, you had very low levels of FSTs. So FST values of two or 3%, which is very low by, by any standard. This is in sharp contrast to the present day situation where you have FST values that are an order of magnitude higher some extremely high ones sometimes, even within continents. And this probably to a large extent reflects kind of recent uh, fragmentation and bottlenecks probably driven by, by humans in many places. We know that wolves today are, are struggling in a lot of places and locally extinct in some regions. Um, although there is some evidence of this uh, kind of increased fragmentation starting already during the last 20,000 years. Um, but so before then, before kind of before the last glacial maximum, we had this very low level of differentiation within the wolf species. So even between Europe and Alaska, let's say, wolves are not very different genetically uh, in this period. And so this is consistent, I think, with this idea of a highly interconnected population where there's just very high rates of gene flow connecting everyone and no deep divergences uh, ever arise in, in the species. And so perhaps these results tell us something about uh, why the wolves re remained successful during this, this period in the late Pleistocene. Perhaps it was this, uh, this connectivity that prevented the population from kind of getting fragmented into little pockets, but rather uh, the species managed to stay connected and therefore um, do quite well in, in this period when many other animals disappeared. Another thing we were able to do with this data set, which we're quite excited about, is to look for natural selection in a very direct way. So typically in population genetics, the way we look for natural selection is we contrast to present-day populations and look for allele frequency differences between them, and then make the inference that this reflects past selection. But here, with this time series across 100,000 years, we were able to do this in a much more direct way. So basically, by testing each genetic variant for 
a correlation between allele frequency and time, we were able to identify variants um, where there's a um, where there's evidence of, of natural selection acting on on that variant across the time series. Uh, now you will get allele frequency change even in the absence of natural selection, just due to genetic drift. And so to correct for that, we used a, uh, a technique you know, known as genomic control, which comes out of genome-wide association studies, and it basically allows us to quantify the magnitude of allele frequency change genome-wide and use that to correct all the p-values for, for the effects of, of uh, genetic drift. But so in any case, we do this across the whole genome, and we identify over 20 peaks in the genome with clear evidence of natural selection. So the top one here is on chromosome 25, and I think it, it nicely demonstrates the, the type of signal that we can uh, detect here. So the selective sweep overlaps a gene called IFT88. And, and below here, you can see the allelic observation, observations in the time series. So in the ancient wolves and on the left in yellow, allele frequencies in present day populations. So we can see that in the very early wolves, you only ever see the first allele. And then between kind of 30 to 40,000 years ago, the second allele comes in and very quickly takes over in the population. And in fact, the, the, this new allele, it even reaches fixation. So it goes from 0% to 100% frequency in the population. So kind of complete sweep. And the, the locus is no longer polymorphic in, uh, in dogs and wolves. And so we think this is actually basically the, the first time we, we detect such kind of complete sweeps from 0% to 100% directly in, in ancient genomic time series over these kind of time scales. And it's also worth noting here the, the lack of a geographical signal in, this, uh, in the spread of this allele. So the new adaptive allele very quickly reaches wolves in Europe, Alaska, and Siberia. So kind of consistent with this idea of a highly interconnected population where new beneficial alleles quickly can reach the whole species. So what does this gene do then, IFT88? So if you knock this gene out in mice, you get problems with craniofacial development. So the skull and mandible do not develop properly. And humans that have loss of function mutations in this gene have uh, various developmental issues that include cleft lip and palate. So we don't know exactly what was selected for in wolves kind of back during the Ice Age 30 to 40,000 years ago, but we speculate that it could have been some kind of uh, craniofacial morphological adaptation, perhaps in response to changes in prey availability or hunting strategies. So during this period, some of the, some of the species that wolves would have been hunting are perhaps disappearing and they might have had might have to find new ways of, of uh, persisting. And potentially this could have been a way for them to, to do that. And then we have another sweep on chromosome 15, where there's a kind of similarly dramatic allele frequency trajectory. And again, the new allele basically, basically goes to fixation. This one overlaps a, a cluster of olfactory receptor genes. And in fact, there's two other peaks. So a total of three of these peaks overlap olfactory receptor genes. And of course, wolves depend heavily on their sense of smell. And these results suggest that olfaction has been a recurrent target of, of selection in recent wolf evolution. And then lastly, this is a, a slightly more um, uh, unusual example because here we have very recent selection. So it appears that kind of in the last 20,000 years, these variants reach uh, high frequency so, and they don't quite go to fixation, but they go up to kind of 60, 70, 80%. And this part of chromosome 10 is actually well known from the dog genetics literature, where there are several variants that uh, influence differences between breeds. So for example, the drop ear phenotype is controlled by a single mutation that's in this part of chromosome 10, but also other things like one of the major loci affecting body mass is also here on chromosome 10. But so then we find that there's, there's apparently been, independently of these things, there's been selection in wild wolves in the same part of the genome. And probably it has nothing to do with these phenotypes, but perhaps this is just a part of the genome that is kind of, um, where there's lots of possibility for pleiotropic effects to emerge and affect perhaps many different traits. Um, so there seems to have been something going on quite recently also in, in wild wolves in this part of the genome. And then here's a, uh, a deletion mutation that was not detected as part of our selection scan, but which we looked at because it's kind of a priori interesting. And there's some, there's, there's some prior literature on this. So this is a deletion that confers black fur in dogs and wolves. So it's a tree-based pair deletion in a gene called CBD103. 
and it it does so in a dominant fashion. So even if you're heterozygous, you still get black fur. And it appears to have been under selection, especially in North American wolves quite recently. So today it's quite common uh, in wolves in North America to have black fur. And the idea in the, in the literature so far has been that this probably arose in domestic dogs, where it is quite common, and then spread by introgression into the wild wolves, perhaps quite recently in the kind of last uh, perhaps 7,000 years or so. But so we looked for this deletion in all the ancient wolf uh, genomes, and we found it in one individual, a 14,000-year-old individual from uh, northeastern Siberia, which has this in heterozygous state. And so while it's not impossible that this individual already could have had a mixture from dogs, it seems quite unlikely, and we don't have any evidence that this individual has, has uh, dog ancestry. So instead, these results perhaps suggest that this deletion is older than we thought. Perhaps it was already present in uh, kind of the, the wild ancestors of dogs and wolves. Perhaps it was segregating at low frequency, uh, but perhaps its its ultimate origin is older and perhaps in the wild. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite uh, remarkable that th this individual is uh, it's one of those examples that's very well preserved. You see, you know, the teeth and the fur and everything. And I think if you just look at this individual, I think you can you can see that it actually has black fur. Which I think is quite uh, quite extraordinary that we can see the the dominant expression of this individual in in a Pleistocene individual from the from the uh, from fourteen thousand years ago. Okay, so that was a little bit about uh, wolf history. I will now switch to talking about the the origin of wolves. So how can we sorry the origin of dogs? So how can we place dogs within this picture uh, of what we have learned about uh, wolf history? So what we can do is we can take the wolves that lived uh, around the time that we think dogs were domesticated, so kind of 15 to 20,000 years ago, and we can ask among dog among wolves that lived in this period, which one of them is uh, closest to dogs. So that's what we're doing in this figure here. So all the, those blue dots are dog genomes, and we're comparing them to um, an ancient Siberian. Uh, wolf versus an ancient European wolf. So, if you're closer to the Siberian wolf, you'll have a negative value, and if you have, uh, if you are closer to the European wolf, you'll have a positive value. So, this is an an F4 statistic that allows us to test this in a simple way. And as you can see, dogs clearly are closer to the ancient Siberian wolf. So, we think we can probably rule out Europe as being the origin of dogs because European wolves from this period just don't look very similar to dogs. Um, but the, the ancient Siberian wolves then, while they are the closest to dogs in our data set, when we directly test whether they are compatible with being the ancestors of dogs, we find that they are not. So we think we can probably rule out Siberia as well, actually. And so overall then, it, it's probably the case that dogs are kind of from Asia rather than Europe. They're kind of more, they have stronger affinities to the east than to the west, so to speak. But we still can't narrow down more precisely where they come from. Perhaps the ancestor lived somewhere where we haven't yet sampled in this project. Of course, there are, there are still huge parts of the map that, that remain unsampled, and perhaps the, the ancestor is to be found somewhere there. So the, the search continues, but at least we're able to rule out some places and say that overall dogs are kind of an, more of an Eastern wolf phenomenon uh, in terms of their genetic ancestry. So that's the first finding, but then it turns out to get a little bit more complex than that, because we found that different dogs showed slightly different relationships to ancient wolves. So in this figure, we are again contrasting dogs to an ancient Siberian versus an ancient European wolf, like in the previous figure. But we are now pulling out different types of dogs on the horizontal axis, just based on what type of dog ancestry they have. And what we what we can see then is that there's very clear diagonal or cline emerging, where there are some dogs that are, relatively speaking, shifted upwards in the plot in the direction of the uh, of the European wolf. And in particular, these are dogs from the Near Eastern Africa, which here are in red and yellow. Now, this kind of cline would not be expected if dogs just had a single uniform origin. If they did, they would all just show the same identical relationships to whatever ancient wolves we compare them to. And we also used the, the QP wave method, which it really is designed to test exactly these kind of uh, scenarios to ask whether dogs as a whole are a clade relative to ancient wolves. And we find that they are not. So we, so we can reject that dogs have a kind of uniform ancestry relative 
to wolves. And importantly, we can do that even if we use only wolves that lived before 28,000 years ago, and so very likely before domestication. And what's great about those wolves is that they cannot be affected by admixture from dogs. I mentioned that this is a big problem when you analyze present-day wolf genomes, but here we circumvent that problem because these individuals very likely lived before dogs even existed. And so the implication of this then is that there must have been at least two separate wolf populations contributing ancestry to dogs. So you can, you can kind of think of it in this way. So you have some pre-existing diversity among wolves prior to domestication, perhaps in the sim simplest case, just an east-west gradient in this way. And then if dogs had derived from just one of these populations, then it would have been, for, for example, fully blue in this figure. But in fact, we find that they, uh, this is not the case. And in instead, dogs then to some extent retain part of the diversity that existed within uh, wolves prior to, to domestication. Not all of that diversity, but a little bit of it. And that, that means that at least two of these uh, populations must have contributed ancestry. And so I mentioned that we think that the first kind of, in some sense, core ancestry of dogs is more easternly. It's kind of closer to, to wolves in Siberia and China and so on. But what about the second source? Can we say anything about where, where th that source comes from? So to do that, we took a, an ancient Siberian dog, which we think is kind of fully Eastern in this framework and used that as a baseline. And then we ask to explain the ancestry of a dog from the Near East and Africa, where we, have, where we think we have the highest amounts of this second type of ancestry. What is the missing piece of the, of the puzzle? What wolf do you need to add to the Siberian dog to explain uh, the missing ancestry in, in the Near Eastern and, or African dog? And so we just tested all the wolves that, that we have and most of them can be rejected. So including European dogs. So we think the second source is not from Europe but there are a few individuals that actually fit as the missing piece of the puzzle. And these are wolves from the Near East and South Asia. So places like Syria, uh, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And given that this type of ancestry is found in its largest amounts in dogs from this same part of the world, that seemed to, be, to, to make some sense as, as, a, uh, as a likely uh, region where, where the second type of ancestry would have come from. Now, these are present-day wolf genomes, so we don't yet have any ancient wolf genomes from the Near East, so we're using these, these present-day ones as, as a kind of proxy um, for, for wolf ancestry in, in the Near East. Okay, so we then arrive at this overall model where you have two types of ancestry represented in blue and yellow here where uh, the blue type is again, probably some kind of Asian wolf population, still unsampled, but, but somewhere in Asia most likely. And this ancestry is seen in every dog we have seen so far. So you can kind of think of it as a, as a core ancestry of dogs. And it seems to be the only type of ancestry in, um, in dogs in uh, Siberia, the early Americas, and also in Australia and New Guinea. So the dingo and the New Guinea singing dog, which you kind of think of as um, as kind of East Asian in some sense, they probably came down from Southeast Asia quite recently. So that's the blue ancestry. And then on top of that, we have the yellow ancestry, which again, we are, we are approximating with a present day wolf from, from Syria here in these models. And this is found in its largest amounts in a 7,000 year old dog from, um, from is Israel, which, uh, which we sequenced together with, with Ron's, Ron's lab here. Uh, Tel Harris, 7.2 thousand years old, where as much as half of that dog's ancestry is, uh, is derived from the second source or the, the yellow type of ancestry. It's also found in quite large amounts in pres present day dogs in Africa. So like uh, there, there's a breed called Bas Basenji, which has quite large amounts of this, of this ancestry. Uh, so we think there are two models that are kind of compatible with these observations currently. So in the first one, there were two independent domestication processes. So you would have had the blue and the yellow dogs emerging independently, and they would have had nothing to do with each other initially before merging together to form these ad admixed forms that we have observed in the data. Um, but there's a second possibility. In the second scenario, there was just one domestication process somewhere in the East perhaps. And then once those blue dogs arrived in the Near East, they would have picked up the ancestry just through wild gene flow from local, local uh, wolves. 
perhaps in the Near East, and just picked up their, their yellow ancestry in that way. So under the second scenario, there would have just been a single domestication process. And currently, we cannot tell these two scenarios apart. We can just uh, observe that we have these, these two types of ancestry. They're, they're, they're both there at least by 7,000 years ago, but uh, we can't really say more, uh, more ultimately where they, they come from. But this, this dual ancestry model, we think, is a really major feature of dog genetics. And here we have um, ancestry estimates from a few um, more dogs, both present day and ancient ones from, from different parts of the world. And so you can see that today, this yellow ancestry is really ubiquitous. So most dogs today have a little bit of both. It's probably to a large degree also the, the spread of European dogs throughout the world, which had something like 10, 15% uh, of the yellow type of ancestry. And so today, perhaps the only ones that, that are fully blue might still be uh, the, the dingoes and the, and the New Guinea singing dog that potentially still have, have only fully blue ancestry. But otherwise, it's really a, a major phenomenon that, that uh, characterizes dog diversity uh, still to this day. Okay, so I will return to uh, the kind of more recent history of dogs in a bit, but I will just make a, a, a slight um, mention of, of an ongoing project that we have where we're, we're trying to get at earlier dog remains, especially from Europe. So if we go back to this model here, it's kind of unclear what early European dogs would look like. So perhaps they would be fully blue and kind of had, had come in early from, from the east. Perhaps they will be similar to this uh, dog that we have up here from Karelia 11,000 years ago. It appears to be fully blue in its ancestry, so it's kind of similar to Siberian dogs. And perhaps that's what dogs, all dogs in Europe, including continental Europe, looked like. Another possibility is that the first dogs in Europe were fully yellow and, and came in from the east, uh, from the from the Near East, uh, perhaps from an from an in, independent domestication process, or perhaps the first European dogs were already a mixture of of the yellow and the blue. So to to, to get at some of these questions, we have been been working um, with some early human dogs, and DNA preservation is not very good, but we have used a, a capture approach, so similar to the to the capture that has been applied very heavily in, in the human field. And we designed an array with about 500,000 SNPs that uh, seems to work quite well in terms of getting DNA from, from early European dog uh, remains. And just briefly, we used a kind of outgroup ascertainment approach to different ways of, of designing these, these uh, SNP sets. But we have found that uh, outgroup ascertainment is a way to get kind of unbiased uh, population genetic estimates. So we have applied this now to a site called the Kessler Loch, where there are there are some some uh, very early remains dating to about fourteen thousand years ago. So this is a, a Magdalenian site where uh, there's a whole bunch of of canid bones uh, alongside uh, reindeer and, and a whole bunch of other things. And so we studied about sixty remains from this site, and. Here we just have a simple test to say whether an individual is a dog or a wolf. So we just quantify how much genetic drift do you share with the present day dog. So this kind of quite cleanly separates dogs and wolves into two clusters. And so this is the, the previous data that we have on the left and on the right is uh, the results from applying this capture uh, technique to uh, about 60 remains from the kessler Lorsch site. And as you can see, almost all of them are wolves except one individual that is actually a dog. And in fact, this individual had been previously identified as a dog on the basis of its morphology by, by zoo archeologists. So I think the, the qu qu quite, um, quite well done of them to identify this, this wolf individual. So now we have then data from this 14,000 year old dog. So one of the earliest dogs uh, known to science. And it's still, it's not a very large amount of data but we're able to say something at least about its ancestry. So in this figure, we're just quantifying in, in, using using an F4 statistic, whether you have any of this yellow or kind of Near Eastern related ancestry. So if you don't have any of that, you will fall on the line, the, the, the zero line. But if you have evidence of this yellow ancestry, you will have a, a positive value. So for example, we can see this, uh, this 7,000 year old dog from Israel is clearly showing a, a, a deviation from the, from, the, from the line here. 
And so when we put this Kessler Lars dog onto the line, we can see that it falls quite close to, uh, to the zero line, but the confidence intervals are very large. So we can't necessarily say if it's, if it's fully blue, kind of fully Eastern, like the, the Karelian dogs and the, and the Siberian dogs. But I think we can at least at this po point rule out that it's fully yellow. So it, it's not deriving from a kind of independent domestication event in the Near East or something like that. It still shares some of this Eastern type ancestry that unites it with, with other dogs. So in one way or another, dogs must have arrived to Europe from the East uh, at least by 14,000 years ago. Okay, so for the final part of the talk, I will uh, switch over to the, to the more recent history of dogs. And we, we did a separate paper where we studied dog remains from the kind of last 11,000 years and asked questions about how we can trace the ancestry of present day dogs backwards to these earlier populations and how this relates to human history in various ways. And also co-analyzing co the, the, the dog data with, with human data as I will show you in a bit. But so first of all, when we study these ancient dog genomes and, and put them in the, in the context of, of uh, present day dog genomes, we found that they, this diversity is well characterized by a single kind of Klein, a kind of diagonal Klein. And at the time, because we did this study before we had done the wolf study and we didn't yet know about this, this dual ancestry phenomenon that I've been talking about. So at the time we didn't know what had caused this the formation of this cline? We could just kind of describe it and, and see that you have kind of Siberian and, and uh, Eastern type dogs on one side, and then you have African and Near Eastern dogs on the on the other side. But now, with uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we can go back and see that actually this cline that we described is in fact the same thing as this dual ancestry gradient that that I uh, described. So this is the same figure that I've showed you before, but just flipped over on its head. So we can see that this is, this is in fact the same Klein with, uh, with Siberian and Eastern dogs on one end and then African and Near Eastern uh, dogs at the other. So this dual ancestry phenomenon is in fact kind of the major determinant of, of genetic structure in dogs. And then we, we in various ways try to kind of trace the ancestry of dogs backwards. So I, I won't get into all of this, but uh, here are just QPADM uh, results where we try to to estimate the ancestry of different present-day dogs as a function of ancient sources. So just a few things I can mention is the African dogs. We think, we think basically most of African dog ancestry play, uh, traces back to, uh, uh, to a source approximated by this 7,000 year old dog from Israel. So they probably came down uh, from the Levant and uh, are quite closely related to this, to this ancient uh, Near Eastern dog. Uh, and then in general, we find that present day European ancestry kind of associated with European breeds is very widespread. So that's the, the dark blue uh, ancestry here. So it's now widespread in pr pretty much every part of the world. But it's, it's worth noting that in, in some places we do find a kind of small amounts of kind of pre-European, pre-colonial ancestry. So for example, in Mexico, Generally, in North America, most of or almost all of the of the kind of native dogs are gone. But we find in in uh, for example the Mexican hairless dog that about three percent of its ancestry can be can be traced to pre-Columbian sources, while ninety seven percent is of, of European origin. And similarly, the Rhodesian Ridgeback is a breed from South Africa, and it's kind of ninety eight percent European in its ancestry, but it also has two percent coming from this uh, this African or ultimately Levantine. Uh, source. So we are able to detect these, these uh, smaller amounts of, of kind of local ancestry persisting even in this, in this phase of, of, in the face of this kind of massive European um, breed admixture. And then the other thing we wanted to do with this data set was to ask questions in a more systematic way about how dog history relates to human history and whether it's to some extent uh, mirroring uh, human migrations and, and, and genetic relationships. So what we did here was to, to take for each of the ancient dog genomes, to take some published ancient human genomes available in the literature and pair them up with, with the dogs to form these kind of dog human pairs, which we're then able to co-analyze in various ways. So we can perform one analysis on the dogs, the same analysis on the, on the humans that have been matched to, to them, and then compare them in various systematic ways.
So for example, here is a, a PCA analysis where you have uh, the, the dogs here in blue and we, we kind of re recapitulate this, this kind of structure where you have Siberia and the Americas on one end, the Near East uh, at the other, and then Europe is sitting in between. We can then take the human data that has been matched to these and uh, align the two PCAs with Procrustes analysis, and then just draw a gray line connecting the human and the dog in each pair. And on the right, then these, uh, these values just quantify the length of each line. So it's kind of a measure of how similar are the human uh, and the dog in each of these pairs. And so overall, we find that the, the two PCAs are kind of correlated to some extent. Um, so we can say that overall, there, there is a correlation between human and dog relationships. But perhaps the most interesting thing to, thing to do is to look at specific examples. And so one of them is that in both species, there appears to be a kind of similar shift in ancestry associated with the Neolithic. So out here on the left, we have kind of hunter-gatherer uh, individuals, both humans and dogs. And then with the Neolithic, individuals shift towards the kind of near eastern part of the, of the plot. And this happens in both humans and dogs. So perhaps when humans came into Europe from the Near East, they brought dogs with them. And so there's a kind of associated shift in uh, dog ancestry. But there are also differences. So this is a, is a dog, 7,000 year old from the Herxheim site in uh, Germany. So this is one of the early Neolithic dogs that we have. And its ancestry is quite different actually. It's, it's more sitting in the hunter-gatherer part of the plot. And so, wh while the humans from, this, from the same site are, are actually much more uh, Near Eastern-like in, in their ancestry. And so perhaps we have a situation here where the, uh, the humans are to some extent uh, picking up local hunter-gatherer dogs, or at least uh, some of that local hunter-gatherer ancestry is surviving uh, in the dogs that are used in, in these Neolithic societies. Uh, and here finally, just an example from, from the Fertile Crescent where Actually, the humans in, in, the, in the Levant and in the Sagros Mountains of Iran are actually very different genetically. But we find that their dogs are very similar. So they cluster right together uh, in, in the plot. And so perhaps this is a situation where there isn't so much human gene flow between these two groups, but there's still contact. And we can, we can pick up on, on some of those contacts through their domesticated animals. Okay, and then uh, we did another thing where we used these admixture graphs, so population history models with, uh, with gene flow to ask whether there are any models that can fit one species, but, but also the other, or generally how, how well different models can explain relationships in both species. And we find that overall, there is, there is no model that can perfectly explain relationships in both species. So we can kind of rule out the very simple idea that, that dogs simply mirror humans in their relationships. But we find some that, that are pretty okay. So for example, uh, this, this model over here is the best one in terms of explaining the human relationships, and it's actually pretty good in terms of explaining the dog relationship too. So it's kind of in the, in the top 10 of all possible models, but it's not identical. So there's some, some shared uh, patterns, but there are also differences. We also looked at amylase copy number expansion. So this is a, an interesting case of convergent evolution between humans and dogs. So both humans and dogs have expansions in these amylase genes that are, that are involved in starch digestion. And it has been uh, hypothesized to be an adaptation to an agriculturalist lifestyle. And so we could quantify the copy number of, of these genes in the ancient dogs, which is what we're, we're seeing here. And overall, we can see that there are, there are lower copy numbers generally in dogs from hunter-gatherer contexts. And there is, there is a general increase in, 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 in time, but there isn't a very tight connection to, to agriculture. So uh, even several thousand years after agriculture, you, you still have some dogs that are quite low copy numbers of this gene. And also there's this individual here at, at 11,000 years ago from Karelia, definitely predating agriculture, but it already seems to have an expansion to some extent uh, of copy number relative to what you find in wolves. So perhaps, the connection to, to agriculture is not as straightforward as we might have thought previously. And finally, um, I, I've been talking about this cline of uh, dog diversity that we think ultimately is a product of these two different wolf populations coming together and contributing ancestry in different amounts. But interestingly, interestingly we found that this cline 
doesn't seem to exist anymore in uh, Europe. So if you if you go back kind of four to five thousand years ago, kind of to the European Neolithic, there's this great diversity of uh, of dogs. So you have some that are much more kind of Siberian shifted, some that are more Near Eastern shifted, and so they kind of occupy a a, a, a big part of this cline within Europe. But if you look at present day dogs in Europe, they're only found within this blue circle here. So all the uh, various breeds that you will, you will all be familiar with of European origin, they all cluster within this very tiny slice of the cline. So most of the diversity appears to have been lost. And uh, we don't really know when or how this happened. It probably happened in the kind of last 4,000 years. But it's, it's probably not a, a very recent phenomenon associated with, with the, the development of breeds in the last few hundred years. It's probably uh, at, at least kind of uh, predating uh, a thousand years ago. But we, we don't really know if it's associated with a particular human cultural event or, 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 or something else. But the consequence is that most of the diversity of European dogs is lost. And probably mo most of these uh, ancient populations in Europe didn't contribute ancestry uh, to to the dogs that we know today. And so uh, with that, I will finish and just thank the, the very large number of people involved in, in these projects. And so this was several different ancient DNA labs and also a very large number of, of zoo archeologists that, that uh, provided all of the samples necessary for, for the science. And uh, thank you for listening.